This video is all about how you can create better, nay, dare I say, the best dinosaur habitats in Jurassic World Evolution 2. I have tips for improving the actual interior of the enclosure, the perimeter, and the attractions. This is the kind of enclosure you might have built a thousand times by now, and it's fine. I do this a lot as well but we can do better. I'll take you through the process of building a habitat step by step as an example, and through this building process, you'll get all the tips, tricks, and techniques that you need to create your own unique, new and improved habitats. These tips are for sandbox builders who want to build spectacular parks. This is not a tutorial about the perfect balance of ground fruit and tall nuts and the grassland to forest ratio. I still play the game unmodded, so you don't need any mods for any of these tips, just a little bit of imagination. Let's get started. So the first two steps are actually interchangeable. You can either start by determining which species you want to use and let that influence your build, or you can start by brainstorming the build and then pick whichever species is going to work best for what you came up with. Well, for this one, I started with the latter. So I first figured out the concept of the enclosure. The shape and layout, which you might think is the first step, is informed by how you want your guests to experience the enclosure. So instead of immediately grabbing the fence tool and building an outline, you should think about what you want the enclosure to include. You can sketch it out on paper beforehand or draw with the terrain tools or just start placing some stuff and playing around with it. So for my design, I want a lookout from the path and I had sort of envisioned it like that and then do like a, a semi-circle over here which just looks out into into the habitat and then have a mountain at the backdrop over here so that the exhibit has like a, a natural backstop over here I would want like an indoor nighttime enclosure and then we're gonna have another viewing opportunity over there and this is just gonna be like a straight side and you would connect another exhibit over here and the same behind the mountain this is also where it would just connect to another another habitat so that's like that's my layout so our shape ends up being like this, which is, it's a, it's a very, it's a very strange shape, granted, but that's actually going to make it interesting. And every other habitat in a park will have its own unique, weird shape, which eventually, you know, they'll all, they'll fit together like, like a jigsaw puzzle. Next step for me was to figure out which species to use. Again, this could have also been your first step. The idea that I had for the nighttime enclosure is what is going to determine my choice for dinosaurs, because I'm going to use the log viewing gallery in front of the nighttime enclosure, making it an exclusive area for the small species to retreat into. The combination of small carnivore and big herbivore is going to have the best effect, which I will talk about more later when we get to that part of the build. So I decided on Apatosaurus and Brachiosaurus for a bit of wow factor and Pyroraptor as a colorful small carnivore. Step three is to start laying the groundwork for the individual enclosure elements that you previously thought up. And you want to start with the trickiest slash most time consuming one because you just want to get that right and everything else around it you can change as needed. For my enclosure, the trickiest part is the nighttime enclosure area. Now, not everyone is a fan of the monorail roof technique, but maybe this will convince you. To make the monorail roof for the nighttime enclosure, I first laid down two lengths of path at a 90 degree angle. One will be a guide so we know where to place the start of each track and the other will force the track to snap to the perfect angle. Then it's a process of making it however deep you want it to be. To get the tracks as close together as possible you want to extend it out more than necessary and then place the next track on the line of path that you created. If you don't do this, if you don't extend the track, the distance will be much greater between the two tracks because because they will want to snap together. So this is the size and shape that this specific habitat design 
design that I had in mind calls for in terms of like the monorail roof structure. Of course, you can change the shape and size to your own preference or leave out this part altogether. Uh, and one thing that is like really important to note here, which goes into what I said earlier, you want to start with the trickiest thing and also the thing that sort of dictates, like has the most influence on the rest of the design. Because having built this now, I think the enclosure overall is way too big. So I'm actually going to start over, which, you know, might be a little bit frustrating, but that is one thing that you really have to just be willing to do if you want to have the best results. You have to be willing to start over. It's really not that big of an issue. And, you know, we're not like actually starting over, right? All we're doing is like redoing the, um, like, like the outlines. So we had like sort of straight like that. And actually, I think if we go like that, so then this goes off. We had like a really soft shape to it. And then this uh, about here is where we had like another viewing opportunity. And then this is our mountain backdrop, and this is the straight edge that we had. I think that's a, a way better size for, for like the proportion of this thing over here. So we can get rid of this path, like little guideline over there. And now on one end, which is going to be this end, I'm going to place a viewing gallery. And we want to we want to preserve the pillar, so I'm gonna pull it back. Actually, maybe I can get rid of like the f no 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 no. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah. And now on the other end, where the nighttime enclosure opens up into the rest of the habitat, I'm gonna place this log viewing gallery, and this is gonna close off the nighttime enclosure to everything except the smallest species that we're gonna put in. And I want to preserve like the two front pillars. So that might take a little bit of trial and error. Let's make sure that it's centered. First time's a charm. I love it when that happens. So now we've, we've created kind of a, an interesting viewpoint here. We're just looking out into the habitat. And here we're looking into the nighttime enclosure. Now this area that we left available here, this, like, this is all going to be guest access. So this space is very small and that makes the odds slim that the dinosaurs will wander in here on their own accord. So this is where the diet of this species comes into play. And now by placing a, oh, it's already selected, by placing a meat feeder in here, and we'll get it as close to the viewing gallery as possible, we will have guaranteed that our small carnivores actually come in here. The big species for this specific habitat design has to be either a big herbivore or a piscivore. You need something that doesn't require a meat or goat feeder in the big part of the enclosure, because if you do that, the small carnivores will just eat from that and have no particular reason to get into the nighttime habitat, reducing the odds that they will, when in fact you want to achieve the opposite. You want to maximize the odds that they're going to go in there. The other groundwork that I did in step three is creating the guest path, or at least like the first lines of it. I created the mountain, the sunken terrain, which actually gives, you know, a nice viewpoint from the path. I've built a slope, which naturally allows our dinosaurs to go up. And I will show you how we prevent the dinosaurs from going up in the sharper sections. And of course, I also added a body of water. You can also see how it has again deviated from my sketch. I shrunk down this circle quite a bit because it was way too big when I drew it with the terrain tool. And you have to really be open to that to make these changes on the fly. But now you can see that the exhibit has really started to take shape and we can go on to step four, which is making it a functional enclosure so that we can actually contain our animals not unimportant. Some tips for doing this, don't use the same fence type throughout. Use a fence type that best serves the purpose. For example, I'm using concrete fencing here because this is just a wall between two exhibits. At the back of the enclosure, I'm using invisible fencing to prevent the dinosaurs from climbing the mountain, but without being an eyesore in the natural landscape. And I'm using objects at the front to create the perimeter along the path. 
This is where your imagination comes in, and you'd have to pretend that there's a line of invisible fencing underground to keep the animals contained. In this area, I could have placed another viewing gallery, but instead I've made a window in the fence, since we are pretending that guests can see the dinosaurs without the absolute need for a viewing attraction. You know, we're applying a little bit of logic to the game, that is lacking. If you are playing Jurassic World Evolution 2 on an older console, you don't have all fence types available at once, nor do you have the all buildings and all decorations option in one save file. However, I don't want to let that discourage you and have you thinking that you can't build cool stuff. You totally can. For example, I built this entrance plaza in last week's entrance tips video, and this is built with the all buildings option, which someone complained about on Twitter. So then I rebuilt it like this. This only uses the Jurassic Park buildings and decorations and the desert biome foliage. So this is fully compatible with the limitations of an older console. And the two give pretty much exactly the same vibe. I think they are both beautiful. If you are playing on an older console, you do have to make some compromises and get creative with substitutes, but you can definitely achieve fantastic results. For the current park that we are building during live streams, I'm actually using the Jurassic Park era only setting instead of the all buildings option. Consider subscribing to the channel for regular tips videos just like this, as well as speed builds, building series, and of course the live streams. It's super easy to subscribe. There's, there's, a, there's a button right there, right there on the screen. Step five is to add details to the interior of the enclosure. That means all of your nature, basically. With the terrain brush, you want to avoid just filling in complete patches with sharp edges. Use the smallest size of the brush to create random shapes and veins, and the biggest size brush with a light touch to create faded edges and overall faded textures. To ensure the dinosaurs don't walk up the steeper edges of our terrain elevation and actually use the ramp, I've blocked off everywhere where I don't want them to walk with a line of rocks, and I did my best to make that look natural by switching up the, the size of the rocks, the type of the rocks, and not just following the top of the line perfectly. For rock placements, instead of just randomly dotting them around the enclosure, I like making rock formations, filling in the gaps with foliage. I use the foliage brush wherever I can for the bulk of the trees, and then I use the individually placeable trees for more exact placement. Always check the sightlines from your viewing points into the habitats to make sure that you aren't obstructing too much and that you're framing the view nicely. I've turned off the need for herbivores to eat, so I don't have to use the paleo foliage because they don't always look right in the biome that you are building in. I, like, I get the paleobotany system, I kind of like it, but I also would love for a return of the herbivore feeders. Is that controversial? I don't know. Comment down below what you think. And on your way down, hit the like button if you've been enjoying the video. That helps out a lot in the YouTube algorithm. In step six, we add details to the outside of the enclosure. I consider the direct exterior of a habitat as part of a habitat build because it all works together. You're seeing it all at once on the screen. So having a shoddily made guest area surrounding a beautiful habitat really detracts from the beauty of the habitat. That's why I always include these surrounding guest areas in my series of exhibit speed builds. For this specific design, I've added a monorail circle because I think it helps ground the monorail roof of the nighttime enclosure. It makes it stand out less and the two structures together create more balance and unity. Within the monorail pagoda, so to speak, I've added an extra plateau. So there are two levels from which guests can look into the exhibit. I've broken up this larger path section with a boxed in seating area, complete with a bit of a pattern on the floor to make it feel more like its own thing. I've also created this little photo op off to the side where guests can have their picture taken in front of the backdrop of the exhibit. I have a video with more fake attraction ideas like this, which I will link at the end, and you can check that out and take those ideas and apply them to your own habitats. The wall pieces from the Jurassic Park update are excellent for creating secluded guest sections and making more convincing tunnels in combination with the monorail structure. I hope seeing the process of this build broken down into steps 
gives you the tools to make your own awesome habitats. It's important to remind you that this is just an example. The tips I've used for creating this habitat can be applied to create all kinds of enclosures and make them the best version of themselves. So when you're looking at this, you need to consider the individual elements that have all come together to create this habitat and make it look good and realize that you can mix and match and apply these in almost endless variations to create a different enclosure every single time. Now this habitat did take me a full hour to build, which is a time investment you might not want to make for every enclosure within a park. I certainly don't go this in depth for all of my builds either. A good middle ground could be to make a handful of these well thought out habitats as key areas within your park and build simpler habitats around it. That makes it easier for yourself, but you still have these eye catching enclosures that will elevate the look of the overall park. If you want more specific examples to further inspire you or to recreate, I have a whole playlist with exhibit speed builds that you can check out, as well as other tips videos on how to create beautiful entrances, new attractions, and how to create different biomes within every single biome for even more variety in your dinosaur habitats within one park. Thank you so much for watching, liking, subscribing, and until next time, enjoy the game.